talking about things that are most relevant, in our opinion, uh, to the normal <laughs> kinds of cases that are covered here. So tracking down uh, anonymous websites, bloggers, uh, scam sites, Ponzi scheme sites, anybody's out there promoting. We're going to show you how to actually track down those sites, validate them, uh, and then the goal here, and the reason that Cheryl's here with me, is we're going to talk about where the technical side ends and the legal side begins. And we're going to show you at each point um, the technical merits of what you can do, the, the limits of where we can go, uh, what you can do yourselves versus what you could pay someone else to do, because some of this stuff isn't that hard, and, and then where the law can step in to help once you've actually shown there's some cause of action. Uh, then we're going to go from there and we're going to start showing you some of the more interesting things we can do now once you actually have identified a suspect and actually have some ability to get devices from them, the information we can recover, and all the fun stuff that we get to do. So, so who are we? So I'm uh, Cheryl Falk, a data security partner at Winston & Strawn, and I got involved in computer forensics through trade secret investigations and litigations about 10 years ago. And so I'm one of the few lawyers who speaks tech. <clears throat> and uh, one thing I know is when I need to bring in someone who's a great expert, which is David Cowan. My favorite testifying expert, uh, there are three things you need to know about Dave. One, he's the author of the Hacking Exposed Computer Forensic Books. Uh, two, he wins awards uh, three years in a row for forensic research. And third, he's a great testifying expert. <clears throat> so if I have a case that, that is um, not your typical computer forensics case, I've got to get Dave every time. Um, so <clears throat> that's who we are. And if you'll go to the next slide, Dave. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through the things that we think are most relevant to what you do. But obviously, it's a small group. <laughs> you can ask us anything you want. We have, we're going to have some time. Uh, in theory, they've given us an hour and a half. I have enough content to, to cover that time and hopefully keep it interesting. Uh, but if at some point all of you say, Dave, we're done, uh, talk about something else, I'm okay with that. So in other words, right, or if, if we're on a topic and there's a question that you want answered, because there's just a few of us, raise your hand. We'll yeah. stop right then and we'll address your question. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go through uh, anonymous and slanderous websites, Ponzi schemes, all the rest of the kind of stuff, tracking down anonymous emails, um, what we can do with mobile forensics these days, including car forensics, um, all about cloud backups, what we can get, new things we can do now to actually recover information even after data's been wiped, uh, how to identify what's been wiped, using that to further your motions, uh, being able to prove more things to get more sanctions, and, and then lastly, what else can we do? So all sorts of fun stuff. So I thought we'd start with the thing that, you know, knowing uh, Mr. Marchant and helping him with some things for the years, <clears throat> and, and some of the other people from this conference that I've worked with in the past, this is typically one of the first calls we get. It's, hey Dave, there's this website, and the things they're putting on it are either illegal, <laughs> conveying things that can't be true, or saying horrible things about me. <laughs> Can you find out who this is? So one of the first things when you see something unpleasant on a website, you need to make sure that you preserve it, that you document it, that you have it. I can't tell you the number of times where we see someone who's infringing on a patent, for example, or they have a copyright violation, and as soon as you send them a demand letter or you file suit, website's gone. Um, and a lot of folks just, you know, hit the PDF button and try to, but, but there's better programs. You know, uh, HTT Track can create a living copy of the website. So it gets everything that's all linked, and it's just a very powerful tool when you go to get an injunction, um, it's a very powerful tool to show the court what the website consisted of. Yeah, and AT Track is actually free. Mm -hmm. um, it's free, it's open source, and exactly like Cheryl said, it'll create a, a living version of the website. You can actually click on, uh, load the pages, load the documents, it'll actually crawl the entire site, find some of the more hidden documents you may not have seen yourself. It'll download it all and keep it, and you can customize the, the identifier it provides to the website. Mm -hmm. Now, the one thing to know is that it's also very noisy. So if you're going after someone and you think they're paranoid and they're watching their logs and if they suddenly see 10,000 accesses in a row <laughs> coming from one place, you may have tipped your hand. But you can configure that. You can actually throttle it down. You might consider going behind a proxy. Uh, there's different ways you can actually tone that down so maybe it doesn't look as suspicious that suddenly their entire website is being accessed at once. And Dave, I think HTT Track, can it also go beyond some of the private stuff mm -hmm. so you can in the capturing of the website, you can access information that you couldn't if you were just... Yeah, it's going to try to find some of the more publicly 
uh, available directories and things that may, there may be an indirect link to, and then it's going to grab all the back-end code that's being provided as well. Uh, so everything it can find, it's going to grab down whether or not it's immediately visible. So there have been times, especially in some of the anonymous bloggers, um, where we'll find a directory, like an uploads directory, that they forgot to protect. And so in there, suddenly, there'll be additional pictures that they didn't mean to expose to the public. And in those pictures, we'll find things that could actually track their identity. So one of the first things that I do nowadays, other than grabbing the website, because I have to have the website if I'm going to prove and show they're doing something they shouldn't, is I'm going to actually track down their domain information. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people now using these private domain registrations, where they're actually paying a company to be an intermediary to say, I don't have to provide you my real information, my real address. It's simply going to say domains by proxy or privacy registration, whatever that is. But what we found a lot of times is that the people who are behind these sites don't start off thinking about that. And there may actually be a 24-hour to 3-hour period where it was registered under a different name. There are actually services, and I'm showing you a screenshot here from a service called Domain Tools, that actually keep track of all of the domain registration changes that occur to a domain. And so right here, I'm showing you Offshore Alert's history. So offshorealert.com has over one, sorry, 200, yeah, two, 111, there we go, 111 different records. So they have actually not only preserved them all, but they've tracked every change. So you can actually go back in time and see it all the way back to the first registration of the site. They also track and they keep a record of every time a domain changes hands. So if a domain was used for a legitimate purpose before, it expired, and then someone picked it up and started using it for a nefarious purpose, you can actually get that date of transfer here and see when it changed hands from who to who. That can be important because if you can actually see the registrar who is involved, what the point and the goal of some of this section is, is to find out when money had to exchange hands for an event to occur. Because when money changes hands, some identity may have been revealed. So domain registrations, domain registrars have to be paid unless the registrar itself is accepting Bitcoin or something like that. Uh, when uh, domains are expired and renewed, if domains are purchased and transferred between owners, some type of transaction had to occur unless someone's just friends with someone else and says, sure, you can have it. The next thing. Historical website content. Does, does everyone know about the Wayback Machine? Or does anybody not know about the Wayback Machine? Uh, th this is great because, you know, you can go back and see uh, websites at, at prior iterations. And this is also something that's good if you've got, um, you know, a theft of trade secret case where they have a website and their thing looks just like the thing you make and they used to work for you and you know that they stole your thing. Um, you can go back and capture that information. And so Wayback basically is a public crawler. So think of it like Google, except of indexing everything, it's simply copying everything and storing it forever. And it does it on a semi-periodic basis. And uh, what's unfortunate about Wayback, though, is it doesn't just look for new websites to exist. Um, it actually has to find a link to it, or someone has to request it. Someone has to ask to pull it up. Um, but Wayback will keep lots and lots of information. Uh, in this case, this is offshorealert.com, because I thought, you know, it'd be fun if we're going to investigate a website in this session, we should talk about David Marchand's website. Um, you can see it actually goes all the way back to 1999. And this website actually has saved copies of the website in each iteration that it saved all the way back to 1999. So you can actually see not only the look and feel, but the content of what was on that site in each point in time when it visited. This is also important because not only is it important to capture the contents of the site today, to be able to show that whatever it is that your complaint involves uh, was occurring, uh, and you want to preserve that so you can show a cause of action, but you want to show what was previously there. If over time they've also done other things they shouldn't have done, or if they previously had revealed something or said something they didn't mean to, and then they went back and cleaned it up, a lot of times it will be preserved there. And so there's some luck involved because it doesn't purport to collect everything. No, it does not collect everything. So this is what offshore looked like, excuse me, offshore alert looked like in 1999. Much different website. And it basically talked about Marchant's lawsuit. And then he evolved that into the site we have today. Now, here's one really cool thing about offshore, uh, not offshore alert, which is a cool site as well, but uh, Wayback Machine, which is located at archive.org. If you need to be able to prove up the contents of that website, 
archive.org will actually, if you ask them to and pay them $250, create an affidavit that states this was the contents of the website at this time. So it's really great. They have like this fact like, like um, here's how we do it. And if you really, really think you need an affidavit, then for $250. <laughs> I, I think it used to be like $35, yeah, but it's it, gone up. It was much cheaper, but apparently people were taking advantage of the situation, uh, asking for lots of affidavits, so they raised the price. But still, 250 bucks to be able to say, you know, 10 years ago, this is what was on there. It's a pretty good deal. And so what this does is this solves the problem for you when you go to court and you need to get, need to get a TRO, and you need to make sure that the evidence is admissible, and that the court will actually accept it. Um, it's, it's a pretty quick fix to getting a website authenticated. Yep. Now let's say that someone had, uh, let's say, a, a robots.txt or asked Wayback to delete their records because Wayback can have a request saying, hey, just stop tracking my stuff and get rid of all the stuff that you had about me. They may honor that request. And then you're left with, well, what else is there? What else can I get? Google has a seldom used feature in its kind of all power tools of, of searching called the show me results in a date range. Now, a lot of people may have seen this before where you can drop it down and say, show me the last day, the last month, the last year. But Google has another option called custom date range. And in custom date range, you can place any date range you would like. And in this case, I'm telling it for uh, specifically offshorealert.com, the website, only show me results you actually crawled in that time. So these are pages that existed in the time period specified. Now, this worked out very well for me in one case I had, where we had an executive who actually decided to start a company while working for the other company, and not only start it, but steal all the information from the old company to populate the new company's website. Sounded like a good idea to him. <laughs> Once he was contacted, he suddenly cleaned it all up, and my client didn't archive it first. So we went, he deleted all the backups from archive.org. He was a technical guy, he was pretty smart. He didn't think about Google. So on Google, I was able to put his site, specify the time period where he was still employed, and what I found out is that Google was actually crawling his new site without him realizing it, and it was grabbing cached copies of the PDFs he was uploading with the old company's logo still on them, purporting to be his products. This happens all the time. <laughs> and it's funny because sometimes it's the most technical people that makes the simplest errors because they're not paranoid enough. They're the ones who think they're too smart to be caught. <laughs> it's the non-technical people sometimes that are even more careful because they're like, I don't know what I'm doing. I should really look into this. <laughs> but technical people are like, oh, I, I got this. It's not going to be a problem. So Dave's comment reminds me. So a lot of what I do is investigate trade secret theft. And a lot of people look like right before they left, the 48 hours, you know, do they plug in a USB device or an external hard drive? And, you know, many times they do, but they've already stolen it a long time before. Typically when they steal it, there are a couple of ways you know. First of all, they're Googling like new Corvette or Ranch in Colorado. You know, they have dreams of big money and you catch them Googling um, uh, expensive items. And the second is, when do they register their new website? And if you've got them registering their new website four months prior, you need to look four months prior. That's when the big theft occurs. So why are we pulling out all these documents? Why are we looking for these things? This is not going to reveal someone's identity, is it, Dave? Maybe not, but maybe it will. Um, as we go through this section, you'll see there's actually things we can dig out from these documents and from these pages that may actually reveal additional information about our suspect. And it places in context when they're copying data. Yes, and it places in context when things are up, what previously existed, because sometimes you have to be able to prove that up. Because I know this will shock all of you, but people lie. They lie to me all the time. So let's say you went down this route and you weren't lucky with the hosting information, you weren't lucky with the contents of the site being enough of what you need, uh, and you need to go deeper. Well, there's two things typically people have to pay for if they're running kind of a more professional site, not just you know a WordPress or a blogger blog, but actually having their own website with their own presence and trying to appear to be a legitimate company of some sort, even though they're not. And one of those two things is email. Typically, you have to pay for email hosting, unless you're redirecting to a free service. In those cases, you can always find out who is providing email services for a company by simply looking up something called the MX record. So MX stands for mail exchange. I'm showing here the technical way to do it, but you can go to a website like DNS Stuff, that's dnsstuff.com, and they have a little box that says, look up mail exchange. You type in the website and it'll show you who the mail server is. 
But here we can see that offshorealert.com is actually served by emailserver.com. And if I go to emailserver.com, I get this really generic looking website that says, hey, you can log in and check your email. If you have any questions, you can email us at this really anonymous looking site. But if I Google it, I would find out this is a Rackspace site. Rackspace.com actually owns emailserver.com. It's their uh, hosting platform to provide email services to anyone who wants to pay for it. So all I would have to do then at that point would be to contact Rackspace it with a subpoena to say, who's paying for this account? And I will have an identity. So really, that's, that's kind of the big thing. But it's not all. So let's say we were unlucky enough uh, that they were not using a separate email hosting provider. Or let's say we were unlucky enough they were pointing to a free email hosting provider, but they still were hosting their company somewhere. Well, then we can look up who they're really hosting with. And what we do to do that is we're going to look up, in this case, I'm back on domain tools. And I'm looking up to see where uh, offshorealert.com is being hosted. And you can see that the IP address shows that it's being hosted by Armor. And a quick Google would actually show armor.com's website. Now, this is where it gets funny in a lot of the cases we've done. We've had suspects who thought they were hosting their content in a foreign country but they didn't realize that the foreign national was simply reselling the services of a United States-based entity. Because all they do is they check the website, not the IP addresses allocated. But reselling of hosting services is incredibly common. It, if it was tiered with pr prizes, it might be a multi-level marketing scheme at this point. Uh, but it's not. Uh, instead, they're just people who are out there wholesaling, uh, saying, if you pay me this much money, you can host as many websites as you want. And then the people underneath them will go through and sell individual websites trying to make a profit. So my suspect thought he was paying an Australian web hosting company to host his products so that he would be immune from U.S. law enforcement, which off probably was, you know, was a bad idea considering the amount of cooperation that occurs. But um, regardless, what we found out by actually looking up their hosting records is that his Australian company was simply reselling the services of a company that was only 10 miles from my office. <laughs> my suspect didn't know this. I was very happy he didn't know this because suddenly we had a US entity that we can easily reach out to and say, by the way, this website is illegal. Not that it has some kind of contraband, but the data, the, the information, the claims being provided are all false. And we're going to provide you with a court order to take it down. And they did. Now, this is the point where I have to make sure that you understand that pretexting phone records is illegal. That's right. You can't do it. Uh, there's a law that says, <clears throat> 2006, Telephone Records and Privacy Protection Act. Uh, before this act, you could um, call your investigator and have them uh, pretext and find the owner of the phone record. Uh, but the big point that Dave and I want to make is it's not illegal to pretext hosting companies. It is not. <laughs> Hosting companies don't keep phone records. <laughs> they may keep a record of who's calling in for a support ticket, but they don't keep records of phone calls being made. There is nothing in any law that I have found that prevents you from calling up once you know an email address or domain name and simply say things like, hey, I'm having a problem logging in. This is my email address. Can you confirm my login again? You're not getting his password. You're not breaking into the site. You're simply trying to build in multiple stages what information you can get out of them to expose the identity of the person paying for this account. What address do you have on file for me? What's my zip code? I'm not getting my bill. All those kinds of things. This works very well for larger hosting companies that have big support staffs because you can make one short phone call at a time as you work through their phone bank actually gathering information. This works very poorly <laughs> for a small website uh, hosting company because there's like two people or just one person answering the phone. They're like, I just talked to you. <laughs> You're not Bob. <laughs> so this does work. Uh, there is a guy out of Oregon uh, that I use for this. He's very good at it. Um, back when pretexting was legal, <laughs> which was a glorious time for investigators, <laughs> Um, he was also very good at that, but now uh, what he's really good at is he's good at just calling companies and getting information out of them. Now, I have brought this up to attorneys before, and they've all done the same thing. 
I just have my investigator do it. Or they say, I don't know if I want to introduce this kind of evidence. <laughs> I'm worried about how this may look. And that's fine. It's a judgment thing. You have to decide whether or not your client would be happy that basically someone was tricked out of information. But if you're not looking to go to court, you're simply just looking to find this person that you can go and knock on their door and have a civil conversation about why they're such an idiot and why they think they could ever get away with this and maybe they should shut up and go away now, <laughs> then it's a perfectly valid solution. And it's funny how often, especially with some of the people out there who aren't making these websites for a profit, but simply trying to make a statement, or slightly, actually crazy, um, you can actually just go, you knock on their door, and suddenly they're very quiet, nice people. And they say things like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that, and would you like something, would you like a tea? <laughs> Maybe I'll stop doing this now, because once you strip away the anonymity, most people are actually pretty quite cooperative. So the goal of all of this, of all the different steps we've gone through, is to figure out who is actually paying for these services. Who is the person putting up this content? Who's the person who's making your client's life miserable, or yours? And there's another way. Will you go back one? You just reminded me of something I wanted to say. So we had a case, it's a different type of case. It's a case where someone's squatting on dom domain names and they're watching the email and they see a perfect opportunity when my client's about to pay money to their vendor and they, they jump in and, and they route the money to Korea and $400,000 goes out the door, for example. And so what we did was we investigated, you know, who's the domain registered to and then we identified how many other domains has that person registered and what we came up with was a list of 600 uh, domain addresses where there were domain squatting and it targeted one specific industry, offshore industry, and I can't say because we're still uh, investigating it, but now we know um, we know all the different people who they've targeted for the same scam. And so we were able to compile that list and uh, um, it's a great big help. Yeah, the scammers, the W2 scammers, all the recent stuff going on around right now trying to basically trick people into wire transfers to provide information. This is one of their favorite things to do is they get one-off misspellings of domain names that no one would really notice, and they suddenly send emails from there. And they start saying things like, hey, it's me, the CEO. Where's my information? And people who are very scared of the CEO say things like, here you go. Well, very and quickly. It's, and it's even more sophisticated because yes. they set up auto-forward rules, and yes. they just watch. They watch until you would have a legitimate transaction, right? And that's when they jump in. Because sometimes someone will actually typo an email when they're sending it. And when they do that, they're waiting to receive it. So this, actual, uh, this applies there as well. Uh, you can use the same historical information to see when their campaign started, when they started targeting this industry or this company. Uh, this is especially true in some of the intrusion investigations we do. Uh, if a large company is being targeted and they eventually get infiltrated and some data starts being stolen, uh, if we find the original source, a lot of times it's a, an email that was sent and they're trying to get them to click a link to run something. Uh, we can actually see what the domain name was and see when it was registered, start tracking how far back our attackers must have been planning to do this. And so we've talked about different uh, ways where you can uh, uncover the information. And if you're not successful doing that, there's a legal way. Um, the legal way is not the preferred way. I would say it's the way of last resort. Because, you know, you've got different jurisdictions and different courts, and, and some are more or less likely. But here's how you would do it. You would get a John Doe subpoena, and that says, we have um, a good faith basis to believe that the crime has occurred, and we need this information. And it's a two-step process. And the first is, who is hosting? And then once you get that information, who's, who's, um, what's the contact associated with the IP address? Um, so there's different standards across the US. Some have what's called a summary judgment standard. That means your case is so good, you could survive summary judgment. Um, other people say, you just have to have a good faith basis. Or uh, yet other places say, you have to have a prima facie evidence of a case. Uh, and so, you know, you have to get through the subpoena process, and then you have to be lucky. Not everybody keeps the information as far back as you need. Um, so, uh, you know, I would always rather do it Dave's way and use a subpoena as a last resort. The, the subpoena works. Even if it's a free service and there is no money being exchanged, so we don't actually get a financial record to be able to try to track down a transaction, they still had to visit the website to sign up from somewhere. Yes. Well, that's an excellent question. You do not have to give notice. No notice. So, yes, you can go ex parte. And it could be a state court? 
it could be a state court or federal court. That's right. And uh, all you've talked about is ownership, uh, but the content of email can be successful. Uh, yes. Right, you have to be super, super careful. And so in our investigations, if we're gonna get into someone's email, we either get the court to order consent or we get the individual to provide consent. Yeah, in this case, we're simply talking about who's behind the website. The next one we're actually gonna talk about in the next section is all about tracking down individual emails. Um, and there are, we do have steps we can take through there. It's a lot harder than it used to be. Um, in the pre-Snowden world, people are a lot more open about things. <laughs> Can be more difficult. Right, and a few years ago, you could send discovery subpoenas, yes. which is basically, hey, I'm interested in this, and here's a discovery subpoena. And uh, we actually found manuals online from some of the different oh, yeah. entities, and they're like, we never respond to, you know, we only <laughs> respond to, you know, court orders. So if you are going to send a subpoena, the best thing you can do is you call the company first. If you call them first and say, we have a legitimate cause, we are going to send you a subpoena. Who should we talk to? They'll typically be polite. They'll say, sorry, this is happening. You should talk to Paul. Paul runs this group. He'll be able to respond. Make sure it's faxed here. Make sure it says this. We'll take care of it on a reasonable basis. If you just send one, they'll do this. We're not responding. You're a jerk. I don't know, you know, especially the internet companies. They particularly are very sensitive about this. They feel like they're protecting the privacy of every customer, even the customers that are committing crimes, which seems a bit odd to me personally. Um, but especially uh, Twitter. Twitter's a good example of this. Um, if you subpoena Twitter, even if you call them and you're polite, rather than you giving you some structured data that shows you what this person was doing to prove up the fact that they were posting horrible things about you, um, they'll actually just give you a raw data stream that you have to parse yourself uh, and they say that's just the easiest way for them to produce it. Uh, I think they just don't want to be subpoenaed and they're trying to make it difficult for people. So they're trying to create this history of knowledge, the fact that they shouldn't be subpoenaed. Um, Facebook will do the same thing, all the rest of social media services, so absolutely to respond to a subpoena. But always call them first. Uh, GoDaddy is probably the funniest. Um, if you, one time, this may have happened, where my partner and some U.S. Marshals went down uh, with a court order to GoDaddy in Scottsdale, Arizona, and they said, we are, uh, we're here to get the information for this website that is selling fraudulent products. And GoDaddy's counsel said, did you call first? And they said, no, we, we have Marshals. She goes, go away. And the Marshals looked at each other, and she looked at them. She said, we have a process. If you'd like to follow the process, we'd be happy to work with you. But otherwise, you can leave now. And they left. Because marshals, by city, are very different. <laughs> in Phoenix, they're pretty nice. In Chicago, they are not. <laughs> if you've ever met a Chicago marshal, you know what I mean. Chicago marshals are a special breed of people. So, let's say everything else failed. We didn't get lucky through the domain information. We didn't get lucky through the hosting information. We didn't get lucky through the email. Uh, let's say they went to a hosting provider that accepted Bitcoin and specialized in anonymous hosting, and they're very shady. Well, we still have a couple other things we can do. Image searching. <laughs> so one of the neat things that Google can do that a lot of people don't know about is it can actually search its vast archive of data for similar images. And it's actually built into Chrome now. You can just right click on any image and say, find other images like this. Or you can actually upload an image to it. Uh, Google isn't the only site that does this. There's also another site called TinEye, T-I-N-E-Y-E dot com. And the reason this is so neat is that you can find all the other derivatives of the same picture to find out where else it's been posted and when else it's been associated with. The reason this is so useful and the reason we've used it before in a lot of anonymous blogging investigations is that people are inherently lazy. And if someone has made something they really like, they may reuse it, even if they're just reusing a portion of that picture. Whether it's a picture of a profile, it's a photo they took, it's a particular piece of graphic art or illustration that they made. Uh, in one case, one of our guys was using the cover to a book that he wrote. He just took off the text that identified him as the author in the name of the book, but he used the same overall image. So we were actually to show that he had the stripped version of the same book title he was publishing on Amazon, self-published, of course. So this becomes a very interesting way sometimes. If you get lucky, again, this is not foolproof. Not everybody makes the same mistakes. But to actually find out where else this image could have been used, what other places is this associated with, is this unique enough to constitute a fact, a possible linkage between this person and the real identity? 
And like in the trade secret theft investigations, you'd be amazed at the times that the people who steal the information also steal the graphics. Yes. And so they use their prior employer's graphic to tout their new products. So that's kind of a cute thing to be able to prove. So let's say you found the images. Well, inside the images, there can be metadata. And this can be helpful because inside of there, you can find all sorts of interesting things. Let's say you had someone who was a real creeper and they're actually taking pictures of office locations or buildings or employees or whatever it is. Because some people go to these personal crusades and they get very strange and they start following people around, taking pictures and posting them up to scare people. The nice thing about the anonymous blog sites is that unlike social media, they don't clean up the metadata. All the social media sites nowadays are stripping this out. But if they post it on their own, you actually may find GPS information inside of here that actually shows the location they were at when they took the picture. That could be important because if you get enough of these, you can build a profile of where these people were when they took their pictures. There's a timestamp that shows when they were there. Depending upon where your place in the world is, maybe you can either pull cameras or you can just wait with a coffee and see who shows up taking pictures, being a creep, and go and say, hi, Bob. So, Dave, what's your favorite software tool to get the metadata? So I'm using a very simple and free tool here called XF Tool, E-X-I-F Tool. The FBI calls it the camel because that's the icon for it. Um, and you can just drag and drop any picture or document onto it, and it'll show you the basic metadata information available. In this case, this is uh, one of the images uh, from Mr. Marchant's website. It's the uh, Offshore Alert logo. Uh, the only interesting bit of here for me is that it actually says what software was used to edit the image. And the reason that's important to me is, again, people lie to me all the time. So if I eventually get a hold of the computer they were using to create this facetious content or this illegal content or the counterfeit goods, I want to have some ability to confirm that it's the machine that I'm expecting they use to create the content. So if I don't find Adobe software that's editing pictures on that computer, I know I'm looking at the wrong computer or there's more computers involved. But other times, I can get all sorts of interesting things. I can get the names of uh, printers where this was printed to or scanned from. Uh, I can get the dates and times when the image was created. Uh, sometimes, especially with PDFs, I can actually get the name of the person who actually was logged in when the PDF was being made. It all depends upon the PDF driver that's being used to print it. All sorts of interesting information can be found in ways that they don't expect, and they're just uploading this, waiting for you to find it. And then lastly, is something I like to call self-plagiarizing. So we used this recently. We had a, a, a railroad client, and there was someone who was going on different websites saying really horrible, um, horrible things about them. And we were trying to figure out who this person was. So we took some of the uh, juiciest phrases, and we found uh, other people who were using the exact same word. We found one associated uh, with a Facebook account. We had our guy. We figured out who it was who was saying all the ugly things. So you need to find a unique phrase, uh, a unique keyword or something like that. And what your goal is to find the reuse of that on other sites, other postings, other forums, um, other works that person may have done maybe early in their history or concurrently when they're trying to spread the good word of their libel actions, whatever it may be. This is kind of our last, last resort. So what can you do if you actually find the person behind these sites? Please. The social media companies keep it. <laughs> they don't give it to us, but if you send a subpoena to them, yes, you can absolutely get the original images, and you can get then all the GPS coordinates, you can get all the rest. And in fact, some of the social media companies, uh, Facebook and Google specifically, if you can get a subpoena to them, if you can prove the, the name and identity associated with, there's a wealth of information that they keep about a person. Um, Google, especially if they have a Google identity and they're signed into Google, uh, they can give you basically a history of their locations, uh, where they were, their searches, um, what they were doing, the websites they were visiting through the uh, Google agents and redirections that are all kept and tracked. Uh, Facebook can show you what websites they were visiting, as well as their personal chats and messages. Uh, just a ton of information. But again, that requires actually a subpoena or a search warrant. So once you know who the person is, you know, there's various actions you can take. And, and the, the one we usually start with it, it, is listed as mediation. But what it is is you send them a letter, and it says you're caught. We know you stole this data, and you use this device and this device and this device on these dates. And you have 36 hours to call me and to bring your computer and to give us access to all your stuff and give the stolen information back. And Dave, how many, what percentage did you say that works? 90%? Oh, yeah. 95%? 
and the clients are thrilled because they get all their information back very quickly and they don't have to pay lawyers a bunch of fees. So it's a very popular thing to do. Um, the second thing, obviously you can uh, go get a TRO, uh, cease and desist letter. Depending on the type of content, if it's copyright violation, I had a client say, my vendor posted source code on GitHub. And so we sent out a, a DCMA <coughs> takedown notice and the site right away took down, uh, this, um, you know, took down the, the software code. Um, and then Dave, you want to talk about domain takeover. So if you actually do get a judge and you're able to prove your case, you can actually ask either in summary judgment or as a final remedy to simply take over their website. And then when it's done, you can actually put up something on the website that says, Bob was wrong. Bob lost, please go here for good information. One of the other things about the DMCA, uh, it's an, a pretty much unknown provision uh, that a lot of people are not aware of, but if you're dealing specifically with a copyright case, a case that involves someone misusing your copyrighted resources or making a profit off your stolen or ill-gotten copyrighted resources, um, you can actually go in with marshals and through ex parte, uh, seize in civil court their items take them back as the copyright owner and go through them looking for your goods. So we've done this with Marshalls. Um, it works. Uh, judges don't like to grant it. Uh, but if you have enough evidence, they will have to. Uh, in my case, the last time I did it, we've, we've had a couple different times. Uh, one, it was someone who was making counterfeit uh, products for an American company. Um, the owner of the company was actually in Canada and he kept doing this over and over. He would set up shells in America, uh, create the counterfeit goods, or he would reprogram goods to work in countries they weren't supposed to. And then they were able to get the items together, show the judge, judge allowed marshals to come in and seize in a civil seizure. Uh, in my case, uh, I had someone who was a consultant uh, for a very ex expensive software package. And in the end, uh, what he decided to do was create a, a generator of licenses for $20 so that anyone could unlock this million dollar software suite for 20 bucks. And then he sold it uh, and sold it through eBay and PayPal. So once we were able to show the judge, this is a piece of software that unlocks million dollar software for $20 and this is who sold it and we know who sold it because he had a website and we contacted him and we, which comes to the next part, um, we contacted him and we said, hey, uh, we sure like to buy your software but we're protesting PayPal. And he said, of course I understand, they're terrible people. America is terrible, corporate greed is terrible. Um, what can I do? And we said, well, we'd love to send you a money order. And he said, oh, that's a great idea. And he gave us a PO box. So we hired a PI to watch the PO box and then he followed him home and we knew who he was. So sometimes it's simple ways you can use to track these people down. But once we had his identity, we knew who he was and we had proof the software worked, the judge had to grant the order and we showed up at his house, his web hoster, and his place of work and took all of his stuff. So the last slide was legal remedies. There's an illegal remedy I stumbled across when I was researching uh, takedowns. Uh, a guy named Lizard will take down a website for $3. <laughs> You want to, if you need, uh, it's illegal, but for three dollars, that's what it costs to, um, for Lizard to take it down for you. I, I wouldn't trust Lizard. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So we done with the first section, talking all about tracking down blogs. What if you don't have a whole blog? What if you just have someone sending really nasty anonymous emails? So we get a lot of different kinds of these. We have the threat peoples. We have, you know, I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to find you. I'm going to show up to your board of directors meeting. I have a grievance. Uh, we have the alleged whistleblowers. These are funny. These are people who actually don't have real information. They don't actually work for the company. But they say things like, I'm going to show up to your board meeting. I'm going to show up to your shareholder meeting. And I'm going to reveal the connection you have to uh, Brown and Root or Kellogg or some other thing they think is very nefarious. And I'm going to, uh, and I'm, I'm CCing all the press. And sure enough, you'll see all these press people who are unfortunately are receiving this email because they don't care. Um, and they'll keep making these threats. You, know, you need to you know, take this person off the board, or you need to stop doing affiliations in this country, or else you know, cede to my demands, or else I will be there, and everyone will know the truth. And they're just crazy. So, so you also see this. We see this a lot. Our, you know, our corporate clients, they'll, they'll be a, a people going into the websites and saying really ugly things, and you have the email associated with. And then we had this one case against some former employees who stole information, and we received an anonymous email that said, if you don't drop that suit against those former employees, we're going to show that the CEO is having an affair. <laughs> so, of course, we you know, knew where that came from, but you're able to track down the anonymous emails. But clients care a lot about being able to do this. Yes. So the first thing to do if you get in one of these strange emails and you need to find out who's sending it to you, um, you got to check the headers. 
So every email that has sent, and this is very, very specific and important, every email that is sent through a normal means, in other words, it actually had to traverse the internet, talking to different email servers on the way to its final delivery destination, is going to have a series of headers. Each one gets applied in the order upon which it was routing. If you think about this like postal stamps, basically every post office that receives this is going to stamp it saying, I, was, I saw this, this is who I am, and this is where it went next. So that's what you see on the screen is a series of these stamps. And this is an email that Mr. Marchant sent to me saying you're going to be a speaker and this is the information you need to know. So these were all of the email servers this thing had to go through in order to go from Mr. Marchant to me. The reason that's interesting is that each one of these independently has its own timestamp. These timestamps you can trust. They're synchronized, they're internet based. If someone is trying to change the dates on their emails to make it look like it was sent at a later or a future time, Going into the headers will let you see the real time it was being transmitted, number one. Number two, it's going to let you see where the information was actually coming from, which mail server. That becomes important, for instance, with Mr. Marchant. I can see that Mr. Marchant actually sent this email from email server, as we saw before, but I can see that he was actually logged in as Marchant at offshorealert.com when he sent the email. So he was an authenticated email sending session. I'm not going to get the IP address he was coming from at this time, but I'm going to know that an authenticated user with this username was logged in when the email was sent. So Dave, if you'll go back one slide, um, how can they look at this information? Sure. How can they get to this information? So it's appended one line at a time. So it's really easy to forget which way to look at this. So all you have to do is look at the timestamps. 12, 13, 13, 15. Each mail server is appending on top of the next. So this is the first one down here. This is the host relaying the message. Then it's going to email server, and then from there it's going into mine, into uh, outlook.com. I pay Microsoft to host my email, and eventually it gets received and stored for me. And this data is contained in the properties. Like if they have an email, where do they go to see the header information? Correct. So depending upon the mail client you use, um, it's going to be shown differently to you. So if you're using Outlook, um, all you have to do is look at the uh, file and then the options or properties of the message and you actually get to see this information contained within it. Um, if you're using Gmail or something like that, uh, you have to actually go into a different view, have to say show me more and then there's an option to show the headers. More of the web mobile providers aren't making it as easy as they used to to find the headers for unknown reasons. But they're there, you can trust them. Now, this comes to an interesting point. What if there are no headers? That is a clue. If there is no progression of emails on email servers, then either one, someone has planted a fake message, because the only reason you should have a message that has absolutely no headers is that that message was created on that local system. If you send email from a system, it has no headers. The mail servers in between put on the headers. If you see only one mail server involved, that means the person didn't follow the normal method of sending a message. They connected directly to the mail server you get mail from because they looked it up the properties and manually sent a message. That is also interesting, especially since the IP address that will be recorded here should be the IP address they're coming from. So, so far, we have a couple of facts. We know the mail servers it went through. We know the parts of the world that this message went through. If it was coming from another country, uh, we might be able to see that. Uh, we can see whether or not an authenticated user was being sent. If it was an anonymous user, it was an open relay. Uh, one of the things I like to do at this point is I find the originating mail server. I'll do a Google search on it to make sure it's not a, a known anonymous relay, part of a network of, of anonymous email senders. But there's one other very interesting tag. This is especially true if they're sending email from their computer and not just a website. You're going to get something called the mailer. The mailer is actually going to tell you what program was used to write the email. I've actually got to use this in a case where someone said, this is my computer. And I said, I'm pretty sure this is not your computer. They go, no, really, it's my computer. And I say, the emails that I had with you while I was investigating you and you didn't realize it all showed that your mailer with this weird thing called the bat, but this computer you gave to me has never had the bat installed. Where is the computer with the bat? And he's like, oh. And the judge said, where's the computer with the bat? He goes, I don't know. And no one believed him. And eventually he settled and went away. But 
This is just yet another piece of information we can use to be able to figure out, are we looking at the right computer? What do we know about this person? In this case, it says Apple Mailer. I know this is coming from an OS X system. Apple Mailer doesn't run on any other platform. That becomes important for the next phase. So, are we lucky enough that we get a real IP address exposed? Probably not, to be honest. Um, more and more of these mail services are starting to cut out or hide and obfuscate the IP addresses the people who are actually sending the messages. Uh, this is especially true for the, some of the free webmail services we're about to talk about. But if you do get lucky, yes? Yes, absolutely. So anytime that someone's coming to your website, your website has a log and it's recording all the IP addresses used to visit your website. And you can actually mine that, and especially if they authenticate it, say what IP address were they coming from at the time. Yeah. So at this point. So the pretext. Yeah. So I've, I've had a situation where I called Dave and I said, Dave, I've got to know who this uh, email is from, and it's not a good IP address. We can't track them down that way. Uh, what clever way can you come up with to try to figure out who this person is? Yep. And so you can simply call up the hosting provider. Um, if it's one of the free providers and you happen to know someone who works there, you can at least say, by the way, you should probably know that some nefarious actions occurred from this account. And they can either investigate the account and shut it down. Um, if you have uh, enough information to get a, a John Doe subpoena, you can get them to turn over the real IP address because there has to be an IP address they're using to contact and send or download the email itself which then you can then turn over to the ISP to get the subscriber identity because luckily uh, free anonymous internet uh, has, is very hard to get at home. <laughs> you may, once you're connected to the internet, you may be able to, to connect to Tor or one of the other anonymous networks, but the actual service that you get from your house, typically you have to pay for, which is good for us because there will be some transaction record with someone's name and money's exchanged. So let's say though that you're unlucky and your uh, anonymous emailer was using one of the free services. Let's say they're using Yahoo or Gmail or Hushmail or Outlook.com, which used to be called Hotmail, any of those. Well, then you're going to have to hope for one of two things. Either one, there is an X originating IP header, and some of the older webmail providers and one of the one-off ones will do this. We actually get the IP address of the person sending the message through the website, because if not, you're just gonna get the IP address of the website itself. Or two, you're gonna have to bait them. And what I mean by that is you're going to have to create an offer to expose information so good they can't resist clicking on it. And that information is gonna be hosted on a server that you control that only is not exposed to Google as far as the information that you're trying to get them to click on. So the only person who should ever visit that link is your suspect. And then you go back to your logs and you wait and you hope that they actually do it. <laughs> so a situation would be this person's going on the blog and he's saying really ugly things about your CEO. And you email them back and say, I completely agree. I found these naked pictures of the CEO. <laughs> click here. And there's a link, and, but it's, uh, it's Dave. It's Dave laying in wait. <laughs> Um, other times we've done it, we said, you know, uh, maybe you could submit a form. Uh, we, we used to be sympathetic with your cause. Uh, we stole some information as well. Click here to download the PDF. Other times we'll embed pictures inside of the email itself and see if they'll actually download the picture so they can see it. Um, there's all sorts of different things, ways that we can try to get them uh, to basically interact with the link. And that is kind of our, our best condition at this point, because other than a John Doe subpoena, we may get nothing. And even the John Doe subpoena, if it's going to, let's say, Gmail, uh, Gmail today actually requires a cell phone number uh, to activate an account. But in years prior, you could put any information you wanted, have a free Gmail account, and send anonymous emails. And it was really hard to track you down, because at that point, you would have to get the IP address and then go back to the internet provider. So there's still a two-step process. You had to show there was enough harm in the email to get it in the first place, a real pain in the butt. But doing it this way, we can actually just expose the internet address directly and maybe even get a geographic range. And sometimes that's enough. And this sounds funny, but sometimes if you tell your client, who do you think would likely do this? They have ideas. <laughs> they have ideas of people that do not like them or are disgruntled with them or former employees. And if you can get it down to, let's say, a city, say, well, it's an internet provider in this area with an IP address pool for, uh, I'm from Texas, uh, let's say the Austin area. And they'll say, oh, the Austin area. Yeah, that's probably Ted. Ted hates us. 
we fired Ted. Ted's a jerk. Yeah. And then they go talk to Ted, and Ted suddenly goes, oh, I'm sorry. Because people are funny. Um, if you, especially if you sit down to talk to them, if you simply act like you know the information, they suddenly tell you everything. So calling Ted and say, Ted, why'd you send the email? Ted goes, oh, crap. You, can, you may have any evidence to prove it, but simply calling Ted and saying, I know you sent the email, may cause him to say, yes, I did send the email. I'm sorry. I won't do that again. But all of these things are all just to try to get our person to respond. Sometimes, though, sometimes you have even worse situations where someone's posting things on what I call a, a one-way communication avenue. A great example of this is Glassdoor. I don't know how many of you have ever been to glassdoor.com. It's a place where employees can write reviews of their employers. <laughs> and they'll post awful things about their employers on there. And the bad thing for us as investigators about glassdoor.com is that there is no ability to contact the person who is making these postings. So I can't bait them out. So I get lawyers calling me all the time. Someone is posting awful, untruthful things <laughs> about this company. Can you do anything about this to find out who this person is? And my answer is no. No, there is no technical means available to me to try to get this person to communicate I mean, I could try to put a listing below it that says, I agree with the person above me, please email me here. <laughs> but <laughs> other than that, there is literally nothing I can do t uh, technically uh, to get that person's information. Glassdoor protects it. Uh, and so at that point, the only way is a legal subpoena. That's right, and uh, Pacebin. Oh, Pacebin. Yeah, Pacebin is funny because it's, it's used for so many things. Um, how many of you have ever been to pacebin.com? The only reason you would go to pastebin.com is because you're looking for something that someone is exposing out there, usually. Um, it's a website where anyone can anonymously just post a document uh, for other people to read. And then initially, the idea was is that you could share code fragments or draft readings and just dump stuff up there so you don't have to remember it or log in to do it. Uh, what it's really turned into is a place for people to dump damaging information online. Uh, Anonymous likes to use it when they do their campaigns. Uh, people use it to approach uh, and post proof of breaches, uh, expose customer information. Uh, P-A-S-T-E-B-I-N.com. And so uh, when you see something on Pastebin, it's important right away to capture the website because yes. it might be gone. So P-A-S-T-E-B-I-N.com. And the funny thing about Pastebin is they realized that this is their business, so they've made a model where you can pay them to actively monitor all the things that come on Pastebin. <laughs> They're geniuses. Um, so not only have they provided a market for people to post incredibly damaging information online, but then you can pay them to make sure that when yours gets posted that you can be notified of that so you can do something about it. Uh, but otherwise, you can tell Pastebin, hey, you need to take this down, and they will, but then someone will put it up again. It's, it's funny that way. And so we have the John Doe subpoenas. Again, it only works as well as your prima facie case. Um, and you only get what information that they may have required yep. uh, in the first place. And of course, you can send cease and desist letters. However, that can backfire, especially if you're sending a cease and desist email to someone who thinks you're still anonymous. Um, they'll just post it on their website. And they'll say, look at these guys trying to shut me down. Clearly, I'm telling the truth. Um, and then, uh, as a remedy uh, of what one of the things you can do uh, in the event that you're successful uh, uh, in any type of legal efforts is you can actually take over their account. And that way you can actually see all the emails that were sent to them and you can reply back and say, actually, no, uh, Bob is crazy and this isn't true anymore. And you can send an autoresponder that says, please direct all further correspondence to uh, PR or marketing or the government or whoever else. That was the wrong button. All right. Me. Yes. What about Hushmail.com? Uh, yes, Hushmail. Hushmail's funny. Um, because Hushmail will tell you how much they protect all their people and how private and very secure and sensitive it is. And the only thing they do is encrypt email in transmittal. Um, they actually don't prevent their clients from accidentally clicking on things or responding to things or anything else. They're simply uh, hiding the IP address, which is what Gmail does now as well. Uh, so Hushmail really isn't that friendly anymore. Um, and especially if they're paying for Hushmail, they're still going to have to turn over transaction records. So we were getting, um, you know, 18 months worth of <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, never really tried to prove it was him yeah. because he used the same language mm -hmm. and all that that he used in everything else. Yep. So he just proved those documents side by yeah. side. But would there have been any way of getting into them and yeah. full disclosure? 
Absolutely. I mean, you could have contacted uh, Hushmail, especially if it was a Hushmail paid for account. Um, if not, you'd simply get the IP address he was using to go to Hushmail. Uh, but at that point, yes, you could have gotten the IP address, tracked it back to the inner provider, get the subscriber information for the inner provider. And at that point, you would expose your real identity and be able to match them up and get them further and joined. And how long would that take? Um, it could be pretty quick, to be honest. Um, I mean, it could be the, uh, as quick as a week. Uh, the one thing to know, though, if you're going to do John Doe subpoenas, is that most companies only keep subscriber to IP records for 60 days. Some 30 days. Some 90 days. 60 days is the average. Uh, that changed when the government started requiring them to keep certain information. The worst thing that can happen to you is one of two things, if you're tracking this down. One, they're coming from a hotel. Hotels are really bad about keeping records of who had what IP address because you're all coming out of one big IP address when you're in the, within the hotel, so they have to keep net records that shows who in the hotel was paying for access at that time that made this request. The other one that's really tough to deal with is when they're doing it from their mobile phone. Based upon the mobile phone provider, they all have different networks that IP address traffic goes out of. And so some providers are better than others at being able to match that up. So what you really want it to be is you want it to be a cable modem, uh, a DSL, or a fiber connection, some kind of home-based connection. Those guys keep the most records the longest. All right, any other questions about... Yep. So based upon the email that I was choosing to show, which was the one you sent to a group of people as a speaker's email, the only thing I could do is show that you're sending it from Armour on a Rackspace with hosted mail account, no further. Uh, I didn't look at our personal correspondence to see whether or not it was a different uh, header IP address being shown. So it all depends on, on how it's being sent when information is going to be present. Any other questions about tracking anonymous blogs or bloggers before we start talking about some of the neat stuff what we can do if you can get their phones? All right. So phones have been in the news a lot lately, especially one particular phone that has been in the news a lot lately. Um, phones are fantastic because people tell the truth on their phones. They send horrible messages to each other where they reveal their intimate thoughts and details thinking that no one will ever recover them. And they hear stories like the FBI can't crack into this phone and they feel really good about it. And that's good. We want them to continue thinking that way. And you don't even need to get their phone. If you get their computer and there's a mobile phone backup, mm -hmm. that's gold. So I call Dave and I'm like, was there a backup? And I hold my breath. Because if he says yes, we have them. People don't really use email to nope. talk about what they're going to steal or what their scam is, but they text their, they text their buddies. And if they're not texting, they're WhatsApping, or they're Vibering, or they're Snapchatting, or whatever other thing that leaves incredible amounts of evidence for us to find afterwards if we can get the device that they were doing it with. And so you may say to yourself, well, aren't all these things encrypted and they're incredibly difficult to work with? And how do you recover this deleted communications? Well, the reason being is that the communications are actually stored inside of a database. They're not just individual files. Because it's true. Let's say it's an iPhone. If you delete a file in an iPhone, I'm able to get a record that the file was deleted. But the contents of that file are now gone on the phone because of how iPhone does its encryption. It's cluster-based. In other words, once that file is deleted, the mapping of which encryption key to use to decrypt it is gone. And even the Russians have not figured it out yet. But they will because they're Russians, and they're really good at math. <laughs> and we use Elcomsoft, and they're the best Russians at doing this. Um, but all of the messages that we care about are stored in these databases. And just deleting a message doesn't delete the database. Instead, it just has this database that has all this deleted content within it. And we are all very, very fortunate that when the developers of all these mobile applications got together, they all decided on the same thing, which is we don't want to pay for a database. We should use a free database. And that free database is called SQLite. And SQLite was developed in such a way that not only does it keep large amounts of deleted information, but by default, it does not get rid of it it keeps it until the perfect bit of information that comes along to overwrite it, which means we may have months to years worth of information. It doesn't encrypt it by default. And it's very easy to retrieve because the majority of the records are kept in text. So it's very, very easy to recover deleted messages from cell phones. 
regardless of the app that made it. So what I want to do is give you a quick walkthrough of the different phones and what you can actually get from them, what you can expect to get if you're lucky enough to get a phone. So if it's an iPhone, you're not going to get, well, let me back up. There's two ways you can acquire a phone. Give you an example. This is my phone. It's an Android phone. This is a full computer. Inside of here are eight cores, a couple gigs of memory, there's a bunch of storage. This is a full physical computer. What that means is, is I can't just take out the hard drive and copy it. There's an operating system running in here. I have to work within the confines of what it allows. And what it normally allows to the user is what we in the industry call a logical acquisition. We're basically going to make a backup of this phone, and in a backup, we'll be able to retrieve whatever data the developers thought would be useful for the user to be able to keep. On an iOS, an iPhone, what that means is, is that you can get text messages, you can get applications, but for some unknown reason, the developers thought it was a bad idea to include email. I guess they thought you just downloaded it again, not really sure, but if you do a logical acquisition of an iPhone, you will not get the person's email. Text messages, Facebook, WhatsApp, geolocation data, all day long, but no email. If you want to get email and all the other interesting information contained within an iPhone, you have to jailbreak it. Jailbreaking simply means that you're going to be using some flaw in the software to be able to escape the environment that the developer puts you into so you can access the full system as the administrator. You would think, as the owner of a device, that you would be given permission to do so at any time you choose. This is not true. <laughs> and in fact, uh, you are never able to escape this unless you actually do something they did not intend for you to do, which is access the full device. All the logs, all the digital information, some of the deleted information, but more importantly, email. That's the only way you can get email off of an Apple phone is by jailbreaking it. Now, some jailbreaks are permanent. Some jailbreaks are temporary. Some jailbreaks work. Some jailbreaks are scams, especially the ones online that say they can suddenly do something that no one else can, but if you give them $100, you can click on a link. Don't do that. It's not going to work. Um, the best way, if you're at all interested in mobiles and you want to see whether or not someone's figured something out with the mobile that you may get access to, uh, there's a website called XDA Developers, uh, xda-developers.com. That is the source for information. And if somebody on there says they found a way to break into a phone, then there is a way to break into the phone. If no one else has, then unless they're Israeli or Russian, they're lying to you. Dave, just this week, a federal judge ordered a lady to unlock her iPhone. Yes, in an investigation. because it was a fingerprint. That's right. Yeah, so let's say um, that someone had a phone that you managed to confiscate, but it was locked. Because this does require that you have the passcode. And there's different ways to get passcodes. Um, this particular person used a fingerprint to unlock the phone. The judge in this case decided that it was not a violation of her rights to force her to put her finger on something to unlock it. Whether or not it gets overturned, who knows. But what is important for me as an investigator is that this isn't the only source of data. I don't actually need the phone sometimes. And this is especially true for iPhones. And this used to be more true before iCloud. And we're going to talk about iCloud here in a second. But if you plug in your phone to a computer to sync it with iTunes, what is one of the first things it does? It says, hey, do you want to make a backup? Most people say, that's a good idea. I've heard backing up is good. I should probably do that. And what happens is they take a full backup that I would have to work very hard to get from a phone, and they dump it on an unprotected computer with a timestamp. And sometimes they do this on multiple occasions. And each time they do, I can get all the information that I would normally get from a logical acquisition on the phone from their computer. And I get these snapshots and times of their text messages, their chats, uh, histories, locations, searches, all the other fun stuff where they're telling the truth. For instance, and this will make Cheryl laugh, the person who actually, when making threats to other friends about what he's going to do to this company, managed to use the legal term required to That's actually favorite. get damages. He said, if they don't cooperate, I'm going to cause them irreparable harm. <laughs> that was great. That's an element I have to prove to get a TRO. Thank I mean, you. Yeah. He wasn't a lawyer, and I don't know who gave him this phrase, but he used it again and again to illustrate the point of how serious he was. And every time, all he did was make it worse for himself. And the best part was, when he came with his lawyer after we had his phone, um, his lawyer said, well, it's not like he's threatening to cause irreparable harm. 
So we put up the text messages where he told people he was going to cause irreparable harm on the screen, and his lawyer quickly looked at him like you're a jerk. And that case settled very quickly. <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> but that means you had to get the phone. Let's say you got an Android. Androids are funny. The developers of Android phones said, emails, you probably want to keep a backup of, but no one should make a backup of text messages. That's just a bad idea. So on an Android phone, if you do a logical acquisition, uh, you're going to get app data, you're going to get geolocation data searches, you're going to get emails, but no text messages. The only place to get the text messages from is if you jailbreak the Android phone. The good news is, is that Android phones are, I would say nine times out of ten, way easier to break into than iPhones. Most people don't update them. Uh, vendors on purpose don't keep them up to date because they want you to buy new phones. Uh, people are constantly finding ways to break into them. Um, there's all sorts of automated toolkits. Again, the Russians made a really good one. Uh, it's called Oxygen. It'll actually do it automatically for you. You just plug in the phone and it, it just takes care of it and suddenly all the data is yours. Um, the Israelis uh, celebrate. Uh, they're also very good at this. But the point of this is that on your Android, not only can you get this uh, great data if you jailbreak it. But Androids, unlike iPhones, are not encrypted by default. Which means that in Android phones, we can also get much more deleted data, even individual deleted files. So we can get a ton more data out of an Android phone than we can an iPhone. But you have to get the phone. And then lastly, there's Blackberries. Blackberries are awful for forensics. <laughs> 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 they need. <laughs> They need passcodes. Unless there is a, a BES server in the middle, there's no way to reset them. Uh, they're encrypted. They protect your information. There's individual file encryption. Even the backups are encrypted with real encryption. They don't use simple keys. I mean, it's, it's awful. Um, and it's funny, because even if you ask some of the government people who really do this and are very sneaky about this, they're like, what's the worst day you have? They say, it's when a BlackBerry walks in. No one wants to be the person who gets the, yeah gets the BlackBerry. And so the question I have for you is, why did we stop using these? And yes, I agree. As a user, sometimes you're like, you know, there's, it sucks. There's not a lot of apps and a lot to do. And there's another one. Um, but they're incredibly secure phones. So if you, are <laughs> if you are worried about your phone, keep a BlackBerry. All right. So how do you get access, Cheryl, to a phone legally? Well, you can file a motion with the court. Um, you can't get a phone, typically, or a computer unless you have cause. You can't just do it for a phishing expedition. If you find that an employee who you think stole data has uh, eradicated their computer walking out the door, you've got evidence of destruction, you can get a com computer uh, or phone. If you've got evidence that they took information, um, you can probably get the phone. We've had people, uh, investigators, dig things out of trash. There are secret plans. Uh, and that was enough for the judge to compel production of the phones and the computers. If you can get the phone, you're going to have a good day. If they have a burner phone they threw away, you can get it. We can recover data from it. And inside of there, you're going to find all sorts of fun apps. And a lot of these apps are going to be posting these large press releases about how everything is now encrypted. Everything is now encrypted in Transmittal. It is not encrypted in local storage. If you can get the phone, we should be able to get the messages. Whether it's iMessage or WhatsApp or Snapchat or Facebook app or Viber or Skype, no matter what it is, if they're using it to talk to each other, there's going to be a local unencrypted database where we can get it. Because if the user can access it unencrypted, we can access it unencrypted. So uh, kind of a parallel thought. Um, you know, employees don't talk about stealing stuff in their emails nope. or sneaky stuff they're going to do. Unless they're but really if, bad. If there's a link application or a chat app that your company has, uh, often they will use that because they don't think it's monitored. And many to most companies don't log that. And that's a tremendous source of evidence that just is, is not being preserved. The financial, financial institutions are ahead of the game. They keep everything. And that's where we find uh, people uh, arranging sneaky things is on the, the, the link chat. So if mm -hmm. you don't log those, yes. make sure you log, log yeah. this. Same time, link chat, Skype chat, whatever you're using internally. Uh, we had a couple of guys who were using code words for what they were doing, but it was a really bad code word. It was just the first letter of, of the organization they were talking about. So it was not very hard to decipher. When we go to G, this would be really good. Yes, when we go to G, we should totally take this. G would really appreciate this. Yes, G is fantastic for this. So Dave, I can actually top that. So yes. we had someone use a code word for sex, but the, they used X. So like, meet me in the stairwell for X. Oh, how about the conference room for X? And it's like, you, it's not really hard to figure out what's going on here. Yes. 
So it depends on the phone and depends on the damage. So there's different levels of, of, of recovery. And, and so this is stuff that we typically talk about in more technical stuff, but I have no problem answering the question. Um, so we can start with a logical acquisition that requires a fully functional phone. We can do a jailbreak on a fully functional phone. If the phone is not fully functional, but it still boots up, we can do something called a JTAG. And so a JTAG is actually a, an engineering standard. That means you can actually solder onto the board, communicate directly with the chip, and then you can actually dump the contents off. That's only useful if it's an unencrypted phone. So Android phones, absolutely yes, JTAG's incredibly useful. On an iPhone, you're just gonna get a bunch of encrypted data that you're not gonna be able to deal with. Um, after that point, if at that point it's still not feasible, you can do what's called chip off. That means you actually are desoldering the memory chips from the computer board, attaching it to a reader from Russia, and then you can actually read the contents of the chips. But then the hard part is you actually have to reassemble the order upon which the data was written to the chips, which is proprietary for every company that makes the chips, to figure out the RAID order upon which the data was originally written to get something useful. If that doesn't work, there is something that's incredibly expensive that the government can do, and if they are saying you're going to do it, you should tell your client to leave the country very quickly. <laughs> and it's called micro-read. And that's where they're going to examine the individual portions of the NAND chip and determine what the actual voltage was of the man cell to reconstruct the contents of memory on a broken chip. That does not get used very often. And then the lawyer answer is, I'm going to take evidence of the destruction of the phone and I'm going to get you to have to turn over your, or Tom Brady to turn over his computer to see if they're synced backups. Uh, and then also iCloud. But let's say Tom broke his phone, but Tom had a car. And Tom plugged that phone into his car. Guess what cars do? Cars make logical backups of your phone and store them in the car. These cars keep backup of your text messages, your contacts, some of your preferences. Uh, cars nowadays, uh, every time you change gears in a Ford, it creates a timestamp at your GPS location and says what gear you switch to. You can actually map out someone's route as their car drives. This is a whole new realm of forensics called vehicle forensics. We're all very excited about this. We hope that all of you buy new cars. Do not keep old cars. Only get very fancy cars that have modern computers, please. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's a guy named Ben Lemire. He's pioneering the research in this field. He actually has a kit he's made that supports the major manufacturers now so that people can actually walk up and dump your car and pull out your location. And the funny part about this is the way Dan, uh, Ben tested this is not only his own car, but he would go rent cars. And then when he rented cars, he would plug into the car. And depending upon the car models, how easy it was to dump the data. And he would get on average 30 phones from each rental car. And from all of those phones, he would have all those people's text messages, call records, logs, contacts, and everything else. So if you're tracking a suspect, and you know he rented a car, or she rented a car, because everyone is equally likely to commit a crime, um, you can go and you can get that car after them, dump it, and you actually may get a full backup of that phone, which is incredible. And one thing that's so interesting is the search history. What yes. are they searching? Mm -hmm. um, searching the directions to the competitor's office, and mm -hmm. you know, when and where they met. Mm -hmm. GPS location showing where they were prior, their routes, where they were going, what times they were there, how long they were there for, all that stored in the car. The future is a wonderful thing. So there is even now another way. But wait, there's more. Because let's say there is no car. Let's say they set the car on fire and they melted all the electronics and they took a hammer to the phone and they booted the computer down to the river there's still one thing they can't get rid of, and that's the cloud. iCloud is incredibly popular. Everyone loves the iCloud. We as forensic investigators love it more than anyone. Because there is something that iCloud does that it does not specifically tell you. And that is iCloud does not keep one backup of a device. iCloud keeps three backups of a device. Three historical backups for every device associated with your account. So if either be a search warrant, subpoena, or uh, cooperation, you get access to someone's iCloud account. Not only can you download the most recent backup where they cleaned up and made sure that everything was gone and you're gonna get this and they make sure that nothing's left behind. You can get the two prior where all the real evidence is there. And then you can compare them and say, this is everything you deleted, so obviously this is important. Thank you for shining this out to me because there was a lot of data in there. I didn't have time to go through it. The other thing to know about uh, iClouds is they also contain deleted records. Why? Because they're backing up the databases. It's the databases that have the deleted records. It's not a facet of the phone. So all the iCloud data, three generations of it, have three generations of deleted data that you can mine out for even more records. 
So we really, really like iCloud. The other great thing about iCloud is that it's not encrypted on the back end for Apple. Unlike all the other things you hear Apple argue about, Apple has no recourse to not produce iCloud data because they control the back end and the server. So if you send a valid request to Apple, they have to provide to you the iCloud. They have no technical merit not to produce it unless your subpoena is invalid. So it's funny you ask that question. Um, yeah, Apple has no actual term or law or regulation that says how long they have to take to delete that data. And in fact, what we find in some of these larger companies is they may never delete that data or take years to delete that data. But if you ask them initially, do you have this account? They say, no, it's deleted. You just have to ask, by the way, I know it's deleted, but is it still there? And they go, oh, yes, you asked the right question. We'd be happy to provide the information now that you've asked it. Or they may say that's archived and it's going to be really expensive, but here's yes. the fee and we'll do it. Yep. So, yeah, there's, unless you see somewhere in the terms of service it says, we will delete this information within so many days, and even then they may not do it. Uh, for the most part, once things get up there, they want to keep it. They want to mine it. They want to get ad dollars from it. They want to profile you and figure out uh, what they can sell you next. They don't want to lose that data. Data's worth money. Google has its own cloud. It's, oh, yes. I've, I've never seen a hard number. Yeah. It's so, somewhere there's probably one guy who knows he's supposed to run the command. <laughs> Space is cheap. Space is cheap and they want more data. So Google has its own cloud backup service for its phones and, and tablets and everything else, just like Apple. Um, it's not as useful, to be honest. Um, each of the developers basically has to opt into it. So you're going to get the same basic information you would from a logical backup of phone. Uh, so you're going to maybe get some emails. You're going to get some basic app data, locations, search histories. You're still not going to get text messages because, again, Google thought for some reason that's not something that should be backed up. Um, and then as more and more developers are signing on to uh, make use of this, you're going to see more app data show up there. But not, not as useful. But there are multiple backups per device. So you want to get access to the cloud. Why wouldn't you? Everyone wants access to the cloud. There's a legal way. Right. So typically, we're successful. And if, if someone's caught and they have the letter, as part of the process of we won't sue you if you cooperate, they have to give us their phone, their computer, and access to any online applications, including Dropbox or Box or Gmail or any of uh, those programs so we can look for our data or get what we need. Um, compelling production, same thing. If you have some evidence that they've committed a crime or that they've stolen your information or that they've hidden information or destroyed, you're more likely to get it. it it varies by judge and by court and by jurisdiction. And then there's a technical way if you have the authority to do so, where if someone was accessing their iCloud from a particular computer, there's actually an escrow file that's created locally that actually provides a set of credentials and trust. So if that escrow is provided to the cloud provider, this is specifically for iCloud, uh, it will simply honor the connection and provide you the data. Again, the Russians figured it out. Elcomsoft.com is the name of the company. If you have a need for this, this is who we, we pay for the software. And it works very well. Right. So one thing I just want to say, be careful, because there's, there's the Stored Communications Act, and you don't want to get in trouble with that. And there's not a whole lot of law on if you have someone's computer, what can you see and what can you not see. I think our capabilities are True. in advance of the law. So my rule of thumb is, if I have a document that someone signed that says, I can get this, then I get this. If it's on a server that I'm not allowed to talk to, or it's owned by somebody else, then I call Cheryl and I say, Cheryl, I don't think I'm supposed to get this. <laughs> and she goes, I'll see what I can do to get you consent or access. Right, and so the consent has to be very specific. I, this person, on this date, give you access for this purpose, you know, to analyze and to copy and then to delete any information I find. So let's expand that situation then to even more interesting devices. So let's say we're here in this hotel, and in this hotel there's a business center. And let's say that you happen to be following one of the other attendees because one of the attendees is attending the conference to gain information about how people are investigating him. And you know that that attendee went to the business center and logged into a computer in the business center and accessed some personal resource and then walked away. What is valid? What is right for the picking? Any of the information that was downloaded to that business center computer you could probably access and take. You're an authorized user of the machine as soon as the writ says you're allowed to. However, 
if you made use of an existing session that that user logged into to access the backend system that information was stored, that is a violation of the law without consent or a search warrant or subpoena to do so. Now this comes into really funny situations. Um, it's not something we're going to cover, but one of the other things that we use a lot for the cloud stuff is uh, cloud backups and syncing of browser histories. So like, let's say you're logged into your computer and you are home and you log into Chrome. A lot of people log into Chrome. Chrome's very popular. And let's say you then go into work and you log into Chrome. Well then, all of your activity at home and at work are being synchronized. And so all the URLs you visited at home are now being downloaded to your work computer. By the way, encourage all your friends to log into Chrome. It's really good for us. Um, so there has been times where we had employees that leave a company and then a month later that computer has been left on and everything they do at home has been downloaded to their work computer. That's fantastic for us. As long as that we did not request that information directly from Google, it's a passive thing the employee left on, that's completely legal. That was their choice to stay logged in. They chose not to log out and to leave it running. They didn't go onto Google and say kill that session. If I were then to boot up his computer, restart the session to get the synchronizing to occur again, at that point we're entering a very big gray area where I am probably violating the law by causing the computer to go out and fetch that information. So, so a couple of thoughts. Just because you can doesn't mean that you, you should. Sure. <laughs> um, so the Houston Astros hack, remember by the Cardinals, was someone who w had knowledge of a prior password and socially yep. engineered and, and logged in. So, so you would never ever do that without express written uh, permission uh, from, from the person. All right, so we've covered a whole lot of stuff. Now I want to tell you about some other cool stuff we can do, stuff that's now possible, stuff that recent forensic research has unlocked, and one of that is recovering from wiping. So let's say that you actually got someone's computer, but before you got a hold of it, they wiped out a bunch of data. Well, there's two types of wiping you need to make sure you understand. There's full disk wiping. That means they got the whole hard drive and overrode everything. And it's not formatting. It's not formatting, but actually overriding every bit of data on that drive. If that happened, you're done. There's nothing I can do for you. There's nothing that most people can do for you. There's rumors of things that maybe somebody could do. Most of them are lies. <laughs> that doesn't work. If it's overwritten, it's gone. However, if they're overwriting individual files and directories and keeping the rest of the system intact, which is what most people do because they're trying to make it look like they're handing you a functioning computer, there's a lot we can do. So built into these operating systems, and I'm showing Windows and OS 10 here, it's also true for Linux and other operating systems and mobile phones, um, there are actually local resources on the systems that keep track of things that we can mine out for data about what was actually deleted or wiped. So on a Windows system, you're going to have something called shadow copies, which are basically backups of the system stored on the system, full content backups. So if someone wiped a file, I can just simply go in there and get the original copy back out. If they even deleted those, uh, there's an optional feature called file history that makes a backup of every file as you use it, usually not on by default. And then lastly, there's something called a journal. And journals are built into Windows. They start when the computer first runs, and they stop when the computer is last turned off. And what they do is they record all the changes to the disk. I can mine that out, and I can see everything that person wiped. And I can tell you what was wiped, when it was wiped, and what they used to wipe it. If it's a Mac system, if I'm lucky, there is a uh, time machine. Time machine keeps backups of everything. And then if the time machine drive isn't connected, it's actually going to make the backup locally to its own Mac. I can pull out data from there. Uh, Mac has its own journals. Uh, there's one which is called a journal. There's another one called a file system events that Spotlight uses to index. I can mine that out to see what was deleted. Uh, and then Mac has its own version of shadow copies. They call it versions. Kind of snuck it in and like, 10.7, I think. What that's doing now, it's keeping iterations of every change you make to a document and kind of just shoving them in another place in the drive. And so with that, I can actually tell everything that someone's trying to hide from me. I may not be able to get the contents of the files they were wiping, but I can show exactly what they were wiping, where it was, what the name was, what the dates were, when they did it, and what software they used to do it to show it was intentional. And that's important if you want to use the power of spoliation. The power of spoliation. So uh, you're not supposed to destroy evidence. So in a perfect world, you put someone on notice as soon as possible not to delete any data, any relevant data. Um, in my experience, most of the people, uh, they either don't properly preserve or they take steps to hide data. Some of them do a better jobs than others. 
But if, if you've got someone who's spoliated data, there's certain bad things that can happen to that person. One, and this is not what you hope for, but the judge says, okay, well, you know, we'll give you some additional discovery so you can maybe find what they destroyed. Uh, that's kind of a weak remedy. Fines. Um, I hired David Cowan. He spent $200,000 to recreate what they destroyed. Make them pay David Cowan. That's fines. But what you really want, at least, is an adverse inference. And what that says is this. Here's our case. Here's the elements we need to prove. But we may not have enough proof on this one element because they destroyed data. So jury, you're entitled to assume what they destroyed would have proven our case. And what that looks like is a $10 million verdict in a trade secret case. Or last November, a $24 million in a trade secret case, $24 million award. So adverse inference, uh, you can typically get the judge to award death penalty sanctions. In theory, it means they destroyed what we need to prove our case, so we win. But in my experience, the, the judges rarely ever are bold enough um, to, to make that happen. So volume shadow copies, which Dave pointed out, are, are just the best thing that ever happened. Because what happens is you get the computer and you see the data. You may or may not find evidence of the programs that they ran or what they did to destroy data. But if you have a volume shadow copy that existed right before the court ordered preservation, you have something to compare to show that they wiped thousands of documents or the key directories. So the timeline that we can normally build is using the computer, bad things are on there, receives notice of the fact they're being sued, immediately starts Googling, looking for things to destroy data, wipes the data, and then hands over the drive. That is the typical timeline that we then show to the judge, and the judge says things like, did you read the letter? Yes. What did it say? Not to destroy anything. What did you do? I destroyed everything. And the judge reacts very badly. And sometimes these programs that you use to destroy evidence have funny names. Uh, there's one called Eraser. Uh, there's one called BC Wipe, uh, which is actually pretty legitimate. Uh, there's one called System Soap. But the one that was my personal favorite was called Evidence Eliminator. Um, the person who wrote it went crazy. Uh, he is now dropped off the internet, claims that people were threatening him and his family. But Evidence Eliminator was the best program because you never had to explain it. You just had to tell the judge, Your Honor, he used Evidence Eliminator. And the judge goes, Okay, so one of my favorites is Sea Cleaner or Crap Cleaner. And so I had a case and I had um, the IT guy, the trusted vendor, came in and downloaded this oil millionaire's computer and he had all like the secret oil reserves and all this uh, valuable information. And then he ran Sea Cleaner. And I brought Dave in and I'm like, Dave, can you tell me what he wiped using Sea Cleaner? And Dave said, There's not a product out there that'll do it, but let me see if I can figure it out. And he wrote this really cool tool called. Triforce. And so at Triforce, it won't bring back what was deleted, but it will give you the names of all the files that were deleted, which is just brilliant. So that makes a couple points. One is forensics is continuing to evolve, and you can do more and more stuff mm -hmm. because more and more uh, data artifacts are left that smart people can figure out uh, what to do with. Yeah, every version of the operating system, every version application creates new opportunities for us to find new fun ways to figure out why someone's lying to us. And then my other favorite program is Derek's Nukem Boot. Yes. Uh, I don't know if y'all heard of Derek's Nukem Boot, but the reason that's my favorite is I found an email fragment in an unallocated space where the two uh, co-conspirators who stole the information said, OK, we're going to nuke our computers t tomorrow, uh, which they did. Their, their computers were completely blue screened by the time we got them. So we have that for the jury to see that they nuke their computers. That's intentional uh, spoliation, yep. which led to the $10 million verdict. Um, and Apple Utility Log is yep. where we found evidence that they were in that program. Correct. And it gets funnier um, because if you're on a criminal side, destroying evidence has a much worse thing than on the civil side because at that point you're obstructing justice and all sorts of other bad things. So on either side, it's just not a good idea, but people do it constantly. They just don't think they can get caught because the programs they use say undetectable. It's not true. So. This is a primer, you know, kind of a nice warm-up warm for you to understand what's possible, what you should be asking for, things you could do, some basics, how you could do it yourself. You don't have to call someone every time you're interested in a domain name or an email. It is expensive to do this, so there's a lot of things you could do yourself to see if it's something that's worth doing, something you want to pursue. So I hope you do do that. But if there was a question of other things we can do, uh, I teach a six-day class on Windows Forensics alone uh, for SANS, uh, where we go through in detail all the different things that we can recover. And then there's six other week-long classes that we teach about all the other aspects of forensics. There's a lot to this. So I just wanted to put together a slide showing you all the other really cool stuff that you could do if you were interested and you thought it was worth doing. So in case you did need that in the future, um, fun things like on a PC, uh, looking at the webmail people are looking at. Uh, 
what information they were accessing, what they stole, previous versions of documents, fake contracts, proving they were fake, and when they switched the logos or changed the signature. Um, sources of emails, if you can actually get the computers showing they're the ones who sent them. Uh, I had this one guy, and I almost forgot this, and this is a great story. So the company he was working for got acquired by another company, and he was really unhappy about it. But he was most unhappy about was the new manager that he got. Um, she was, in all ostensible purposes, uh, purposes a, a good person, um, but apparently he just really had a personal grudge against her, and he wanted to get her fired. So what he did, and what we found in our uh, forensic research, is that he built a virtual machine to run on his computer. And inside of that virtual machine, he installed uh, Firefox, and Firefox has a mail program called Thunderbird. And he started drafting, and we found all the drafts of this, the most offensive possible email he could write that would target every minority and stereotype that existed within their office. And we had about 10 drafts as he worked to make it over and over again, adding different phrases, targeting different people, making this masterpiece of offensive content that then he spoofed as her to the rest of the company, trying to set her up as a terrible bigot so that she would be fired. So we get a call from the company, and the company says, we got this email. We know it's not from her. I'm like, you probably you know who it is. Yeah, we think we know who it is. I'm like, just send me his computer. So I got his computer, we found all the drafts, it was hard not to laugh because you could see him sitting there thinking and we could see the timestamps of how much time he took in between each email as he sat at work trying to think of the right most offensive term for this type of person and they would change it and tweak it as he continued to make it more offensive and then finally decided his masterpiece was done and deployed and then he got fired. So fun things can happen if you get their computer. So to build on Dave's point, um, and I know we need to wrap up, I put on a program for the Harris County judges, and it was cool things you can do with forensics. And my whole purpose was to educate the judges. Don't just let lawyers trade keywords. That's not how you catch them. You know, the, the computers are the window to the soul. And you learn so much information that you would never find with keywords. And you learn what kind of person they are. Do they cheat on their mistress, for example? Um, so don't be restricted by keywords. Always. People, they're just not faithful to the mistresses. That's they're terrible. Right. So yeah, because the computers just have a world of information. Yes. Uh, no, it's true. I mean, there's a time when if I spend six months looking at someone's computer, I know that person and the terrible things about them. And when I see them, I'm like, you don't get to look at me. I know you. You are not a good person. Um, but you can figure out all the stuff they're searching for. Their Google searches sometimes are hilarious, uh, especially as they're looking for, you know, frantically for things to get rid of things or to do things. Um, chat histories. And then, of course, in their mobile phones, beyond just things like deleted messages, you can figure out locations they were, networks they were connected to, uh, applications they're running, things they're getting rid of, their call histories, all the other fun stuff, sometimes even voicemails that were left for them. They'll leave on the phone, and we can recover those. So all sorts of fun stuff. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. I hope it was educational. Um, again, I'm Dave. That's Cheryl. We'll stay around for about an hour. Yep. And uh, have any questions? Thank you.